And so this morning, I invite us to think about the question, which cross will we take up? And to begin, I'd like to reflect with you about what I believe to be the very most important movie I have ever seen so far in my life. If you didn't see Schindler's List, I commend it to you as an incredible witness to the strength of faith. I feel certain that you could find it on at least one of the many streaming services that I haven't figured out how to use yet. Still, I commend it to you as an important historical and spiritual film. In fact, Lent would be a very good time to see this film because without question, Oscar Schindler moves through the stages of faith development during which he repents, hears the call of Christ, picks up a cross, and carries it until the resurrection of Easter comes as a reality for him. And it is a difficult movie to watch in many parts, and so I encourage you, if you go to watch it, to tough it out until the end, because the end is indeed the hope. In the story, Oskar Schindler begins as a nominal Christian and Austrian citizen who sees the European theater of World War II as an opportunity to get very, very rich. He is a profiteer of the very worst kind. In comparison, I think he makes the money changers in the temple look like saints. He opens a metal working factory in Prague where he quickly decides to hire Jewish laborers from the ghetto instead of the other Gentile workers or citizens because he can pay the Jews so much less than the others and he will therefore get all that much richer. What he doesn't seem to realize is that by employing Jews, he inadvertently saves their lives at least for a while. He wines and dines among the Nazi power elite at horribly decadent parties that would rival Hollywood at its very most scandalous. He offers huge bribes for government contracts and receives bribes from suppliers of the raw materials he uses in his plant he trades on the sexual flavors of women as they were literally seen by him as playthings. The moment of his conversion is not completely clear. It might not have been completely instantaneous, but his awareness or his transfiguration, if you will, evolves as the result of his relationships with several people. First, there is the Jewish accountant who keeps him honest, more or less, and helps him understand the dynamics of both the Jewish culture and the Nazi power structure. Also, there are several employees who are so grateful to be employed in his factory that they thank him to the point of gross embarrassment. And there is even a young woman who offers herself to Schindler's promise, pro, promiscuous womanizing nature so that he will hire her parents and they won't be sent to Auschwitz. And so with the help of this marvelous accountant, Oscar Schindler actively embarks on an extremely risky scheme that will get the people on his list sent to Austria to work in his bogus munitions factory, where he can keep them from the harm of the Nazis. These, refu excuse me, these refugees call themselves Schindler's Jews. At one moment on the floor of his bogus factory, his accountant reports that they are getting complaints that the weapons they are making just don't work properly. And Schindler comments that if the weapons had worked properly, then he wouldn't have been doing 
his job correctly. He was intentionally making weapons that wouldn't hurt anyone. Through his actions, Oskar Schindler has taken up the cross of some of the victims of the Nazi Holocaust. He has repented of his former profiteering behavior. When he realized the enormity of the evil that was surrounding the world in which he had been conducting business, Oskar Schindler didn't sit around wringing his hands, feeling guilty, or even blaming himself. He repented. He took concrete action. He changed his behavior even if that change had to be covert. What are the crosses we are being called to take up and bear? Will we bear them? I believe that it's important to remember some things about the crosses we are called to bear. First, it is important to know what they are not. Halford Luck Luckock says the cross we are called to carry is not some calamity in our lives or some particularly profound loss or sorrow or even some difficult personality trait of our own or someone else. And I would add that the cross to which Jesus calls us is not some difficult family member or co-worker or even a particularly difficult life situation. Luckock finishes by saying Take up a taking up a cross is not enduring stoically what happens to us. That is a great virtue. But Christianity is more than the modern stoicism in which it is frequently distorted. So what are the crosses we are being called to bear? And will we take them up? If taking up a cross isn't what we always thought it would be, then what is it? Luckock actually provides a great answer. The cross of Jesus was his deliberate choice of ministering to humanity's need. For disciples, taking up the cross means the deliberate choice of something that could be evaded to take up a burden which we are under no compulsion to take up except the compulsion of God's love in Christ. It means the choice of taking upon ourselves the burden of other lives, of putting ourselves without reservation to the service of Christ in preparing a way for the kingdom of God, of putting ourselves in struggle against evil, whatever the cost. What are the crosses we are being called to bear? Will we take them up? Ched Myers, another of my favorite commentators, uncovers another aspect of cross-bearing that is often lost to us. He says the bearing of the, of the cross of Christ is not a private spiritual matter. It is a matter of self-denial and public witness. The setting for the scripture lesson precedes Jesus' actual crucifixion by a significant span of time. His audience has no reason to expect his crucifixion, nor do they have our historical post-resurrection perspective in which the cross has been glorified for over 2,000 years. So when he makes his startling statement that hearers receive it, Excuse me. So when he makes this startling statement, the hearers receive it in light of their own context in which it represents an instrument, instrument of capital punishment. <clears throat> and that punishment is always for the most horrible of crimes. Myers and Hengel say the cross was a symbol of shame. The chief reason for its use was its alleged supreme efficacy as a deterrent. It was, of course, carried out in public by the public display of a naked victim in a prominent place. Crucifixion represented the uttermost humiliation. I 
I have a late friend who reminds me that if we are to think of ourselves in the shoes of Jesus' hearers for this lesson, maybe we should be wearing a gold-plated electric chair, which is the modern-day symbol that would clearly replace the cross. It would more accurately represent the cross that Jesus took up. Now, I'm not advocating that we do that, but it is important for us to understand the context of the time in which Jesus made this famous statement and to understand that those symbols have become very different in our own day and time. So this is where Jesus' call to self-denial will eventually add to an, an entirely new dimension to the Jewish practice of giving up certain luxury foods as a discipline before Passover. Jesus' call is not so much about ridding our homes of fat and leaven, nor is it about not eating chocolate or drinking coffee or other caffeine for six weeks. It's about giving up our egocentric perspectives and taking up the burdens that stand before us in this world. Oscar Schindler literally denied himself. That is, he changed the person he was into someone else with an entirely different life perspective. What are the crosses we are being called to bear? Will we take them up publicly? How will we deny ourselves that we might follow Christ? As ominous as all of this may sound, I don't believe that taking up the cross, our crosses is necessarily an awful, forbidding, somehow onerous task, although sometimes it is, of course. But working together in public ministries, including our anti-racism Sunday school program, serving at Cass and Brightmore and Hands for Detroit and South Oakland Shelter, excuse me, and our monthly community dinners, by doing all those things, we can begin to take up our crosses together so that we might share in the burdens borne by our neighbors. What are the crosses we are being called to bear? Will we take them up publicly? How will we deny ourselves that we might follow Christ? Finally, it seems important to remember that while taking up the cross is a deliberate choice of something particular that could be avoided, the taking up of the cross of Christ is not optional for those of us who choose to follow Jesus, who is very clear about that. Anyone is welcome to follow, and while this doesn't necessarily have to be some horrific burden, there is one condition. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Oscar Schindler finally understood this, and now the only question that remains for us is, what are the crosses we are being called to bear? Will we take them up publicly? How will we deny ourselves that we might follow Christ. This is the word of Lord, uh, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.